Hello, welcome, Thursday. No, oh, I did it again. Tea time live. History chat on a Wednesday. Tonight, today, even. I've seen it, I've gone completely wrong. Anne Boleyn's love letters. The news that Charles III may not be letting the bones of the princess in the tower be investigated. I want to do a little uh, spotlight on Princess Charlotte, Prince of Wales, the, the Georgian princess of Charlotte, of course, and also uh, news about one of the probably best, one of the best days out I think a Tudor fan, history fan can have. So I'm going to tell you about that. And next week, I promise not to call it Thursday Tea Time History Live. But anyway, let's see if one week I can manage it. Once we're done, I'm sure we'll... Once I've done it once, I'm sure I'll, I'll remember. Right, so... I am streaming live on Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. Welcome if you are watching live and also welcome if you're watching on the playback or listening on the podcast. You can get links to all of those things from my Substack, philippab.substack.com um, and also on the website, www.britishhistorytours.com. So anyway, that out the way. Um Let's get going. Thank you so much, everyone who is joining me. I can see loads of hearts coming up on the screen on Instagram. Of course, you can support me by buying badges on you uh, on Instagram. Excuse me, super chats on YouTube and stars, I believe, on Facebook, which is a new thing. Um, and I think all those things have to be done live. I'm not sure. Certainly on Instagram, perhaps on the other two as well. Now, so for any of you who've just joined, a recap of what we're going to be discussing, Anne Boleyn's love letters, how they got into the Vatican. News that uh, Charles III may not be allowing the bones of the princes in the tower to be exhumed and investigated. So we'll look at that. I want to do a bit of a, a spotlight on Princess Charlotte. As I said, she is the... Um, uh, she was the granddaughter of George III. I want to do a bit of a spotlight on her. And if we still have time, I'm going to tell you about the best day out, I think, a Tudor fan can have and how to get involved. So let's get started. So um, before we get on to our first story, which is going to be about Anne Boleyn's love letters, can I just first give a shout out to um, my newest patrons, Tiffany, Mandy and, um, and Margie, you're very um, welcome, of course. They've joined just in time to um, be part of Book Club because we're starting a historical book club on Patreon, which is all still part of the, this is the addition to everything we were doing in Patreon before. No more charge. It's just there. Um, and we, uh, this is the, if you're looking on YouTube, um, you can't see on Instagram because it's blurred, but on YouTube, the stack of the shortlisted books uh, is behind me. Uh, we have 11 shortlisted books. So the vote is open until the 30th of, uh, sorry, excuse me, the 29th of January, so Sunday. And then next Monday, I will be announcing the books that we're going to be reading and when the book club meetings are going to be. So I'm really looking forward to getting there started with that. Uh, thank you, Lottie Rose, for the badge. You are very sweet on Instagram. Thank you so much. Um, Lottie is supporting me by buying a badge. Thank you. And I think if Lottie sends a heart at the screen now, it is a different colour, I think. So, um, so small things, I, I find that really exciting. Okay, now you may or may not have heard um, of a piece of new um, research done um, on the love letters of Anne Boleyn um, and Henry VIII. So in the Vatican, there are 17 letters that Henry VIII sent to Anne Boleyn, love letters. Excuse me, I just need a, I need a sip of my tea. Um, they're written in English and French, and they are love letters. This is these are the ones that we get that we know we know he called a sweetheart. We know he nicknamed her chest duckies, little duckies. <laughs> it's from these love letters that we know this, but it's all been a mystery as to how they ended up in the Vatican. Now. It's not been completely solved, but it, they have gone some way to to getting there. Um, now, the authors and historians I must um, mention: Peter Lake, Michael Questia, Kendra, sorry, Kendra Packham, and Estelle Perron. Now, you, if you've been um, uh, with me for a few months at least, you'll know that I interviewed Estelle Perron, Dr. Estelle Perron. Her book, Blood, Fire, and Gold, is actually in that stack there so it's one of the ones that could be coming up in book club and she did um 
uh, sorry, that book is a dual biography on um, Elizabeth I and Catherine de' Medici and includes, of course, in that the story of Mary, Queen of Scots, because she was pivotal in both the other ladies' um, lives. Estelle actually is coming to speak on the final night of the Elizabeth I and Mary, Queen of Scots tour in September. We have a few spaces left if you would like to join that tour. Um, and in fact, that's the one that I'm going to tell you a bit more about later with the perfect Tudor day out because as well as having Estelle come and speak to us we've got just one of the absolute best days I think any Tudor fan can ever have but anyway I will tell you about that later so Estelle also um if you're interested did an interview with me um a couple of months ago um about her new book but anyway so she's one of the so, so obviously I'm, I follow Estelle's work with interest and so and she's one of the authors of this new research so it was printed uh, sorry excuse me it was published in the times literary supplement so if you're on youtube below in the comments um so i don't think i could well, i certainly can't put a live link on instagram but in if you pop over to my youtube which is just british history um in the notes underneath i've put the link into this article it is behind a paywall i'm not sure how much of it you can read without going into the paywall but to be fair based on this article i i got a subscription <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted to read it so excuse me my voice is going croaky already so these 17 love letters written by Henry VIII in his own hand of course these are private letters to Anne Boleyn and um, we know that they get into the Vatican Library but the mystery that surrounds them is well how did they get there when did they get there who sent them and why? So we have pretty much all all the questions there except for the where. Um, although you could have the where were they before they went. That That is still a mystery. But anyway, let's get into it. And um, the one of the most favourite, um, favourite popular sort of narratives around how they got there um, was actually put forward in the 17th century and it sort of stuck, mid-17th century, and it stuck um, by a historian called Edward Herbert that they'd been dispatched to Rome in around about 1529 by one of the papal legates who'd come to hear Henry's um, petition for the divorce. And he named Cardinal Campeggio as um, as one of those. Now, that sort of stuck, but there, he didn't actually present any evidence for, for that theory. Um, anyone who didn't sort of accept that theory kind of thought that... Um, that they were probably stolen from Anne in the 1530s or after her death and sent off to the Vatican. Um, what we do know is that by the mid 17th century, so, so it's still in the 1650s, 1660s, English people on the on what they used to call the you know a grand tour, um, so upper class sort of young. Um, people who were sort of d developing and were sent off to Europe to develop their knowledge of all sorts of things. When they visited the Vatican, they were shown the letters, uh, Anne's letters from Henry. So we know they were there already. Now, the work that Estelle and her colleagues have done, um, I made loads of notes, if you can see my notes, it's because it's incredibly interesting, complicated, and I'm not going to get it wrong. I hope not. Anyway, um, hi, um, Chewingums. Hello, you've made it. And Monica, hi. Uh, watching on Facebook. Hi to everyone um, watching on Instagram. Right, let's keep going. So the new evidence that Estelle and her colleagues have, have found. So there was a um, a big Jesuit movement with the Reformation. You had these Catholic priests, um, members of the Church of Jesus, who were coming to um, coming over and, and and preaching, of course, against the Reformation and and for the the original true faith. Um, and the Jesuit superior in England at the time was um, a man called Henry Garnet. And he wrote to his colleague in Rome, a man called Robert Parsons. He wrote to him in June 1601. So we're in 1601. And Henry Garnet writes to Robert Parsons. Henry's in England. Robert Parsons is over in Rome. And he tells him that he will soon be receiving a pack of letters. And he refers to these pack of letters as King Henry's papers. Now, that letter doesn't survive, but in the 1660s, um, another Jesuit, Christopher Green, was copying out Jesuit materials 
um, in order to send them off to another Jesuit uh, historian called Daniela Bartoli. And he, um, so he, he'd written this out, but he annotated, he added to uh, the information about these, this pack of letters. And he actually wrote the letters of Henry VIII to Anne Boleyn, which are now in the Vatican Library. So this is in the 1660s. Um, now, um, Robert Parsons had, um, to whom Garnet had been sending actually quite a few manuscripts, it was right, had various writing projects going on, one of which was a Latin, um, you know, sort of the Latin history of the English Reformation. Um, in Parsons, uh, yeah, the, uh, Latin history of the English Reformation, he followed on from a story that had already been published, I say story, it's probably not the right word, um, by a priest called Nicholas Sander. Now he's the one, um, he, he, he wrote a piece uh, called On the Origin and Progress of the English uh, Schism. And he claimed central to the break of England from Rome. What are you, are you following everyone? Essential to the break of England from Rome was Henry's obsession with Anne Boleyn. Not only his, um, you know, sort of uh, indecent obsession with Anne Boleyn, but that Anne was a corrupting force herself. So, um, so the 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 the, the um the the shoulders of bl the blame was put squarely on the shoulders of Anne and her corrupting force of Henry. Um, I mean, he didn't hold back Sander on on defaming Anne. He he goes on to say that she was full of pride, ambition, um, evil, and impurity. Um, that she'd sinned first with the father's butler and then his chaplain, because you know being executed for sleeping with your brother apparently wasn't enough. Um, now this was, this was written at a time where they are, <clears throat> where the, the Catholics of Europe are, um, uh, um, when Nicholas Sander wrote this, it, he's, he's, he's building up a case against Elizabeth. So he's writing in sort of the 1580s. Um, so it's before the 1580s, pardon me, because by 1588, his work has been taken and expanded and you've got, um, works that are basically saying, yeah, Anne was also Henry's daughter and um, therefore Elizabeth is illegitimate twice over because, of course, this is the time of the Spanish Armada and they're attempting to um, topple Elizabeth for the Catholic cause. Oh. So, <clears throat> so, anyway, so you've got um, these letters which I've said in, in the beginning, you've got Henry calling Anne his sweetheart and referring to her breasts as little duckies that he can't wait to sort of kiss again. Um, and so they're framed as showing this lustful, evil attraction that, that creates this schism, Hen Henry's obsession with Anne, which creates a schism with Rome um, and, uh, and, and Henry's fall into, or descent into tyranny. Hmm. So, um, what what the work has basically, I suppose, in conclusion, shown, the letters seem to have been sent much later to Rome than had originally been thought, um, which calls into question who had them in the interim. So who had these letters that were so, that, that Henry VIII had written to Anne Boleyn, who had them in the interim to, who, and then sent them off to, to Rome? Um, one possible theory is um, a member of Anne's Howard side of the family, a lady called Anne Dacker Howard, um, who who was a religious. I suppose in the time of Elizabeth, she was, um, I suppose, a recusant. She she had Jesuit chaplains, one of whom was a guy called Robert Southall, um, and he is known to have been sending papers over to Rome. He was arrested in um, 1592, and his remaining papers. Um, a thought to have gone into the hands of Garnet. So if you remember, Garnet is the man who wrote to Parsons in Rome with the um, note, I'm about to send you a pack of Henry's papers, later identified by Green as uh, Henry's love letters to Anne. So if you're interested in reading the, com the complete article, we are apparently promised further research um, into this by Estelle, um, Kendra, Michael and Peter. So we'll be looking forward to 
maybe get into even more information on that so I hope you followed that if you want to um, read that article for yourself of course um, I've put like I say earlier I've put the link to it in the show notes on YouTube because Instagram it's a really long URL and it's not live anyway so if you pop over to my YouTube channel which is uh, youtube.com forward slash British history um, you'll be able to see that anyone on Facebook or uh, you can do that as well and anyone on YouTube you're already there um, yeah, Doug, the potential power of little ducks, indeed. They can create schisms with Rome and descent into tyranny. We knew it already. We knew it. So I hope you enjoyed that. But how fun is that? You know, we know that these love letters are in the Vatican. Um, and also, that I find it really interesting that there was um, that these letters from, um, from Henry to Anne, sort of um, a century later, were becoming part of the standard thing you would see um, if you're an English person visiting the Vatican. Like, oh, come and see. We've got Henry's letters to Anne here. So, um, yeah, and the way they've been framed, to get, so, so they clearly were being framed to show, um, you know, this obsession, sexual obsession, which, of course, the church aren't too hot on. Um, and... Um, y- y- you know and this it all leads to evil it leads to leads to breaks and breaks with the religious um fathers and houses and and then and then just of course tyranny tyranny follows um and then later on they started to be framed as love letters um but anyway so you can get hold of the love letters i think they are published um but there you go so before we go on to the next thing a bit later on i want to um well, thank Martha Zoller first. She sent me a article in the uh, Daily Mail, which I have to say was very difficult to refine, but I have found it. And we're going to be discussing it in a bit. It's um, apparently news about Charles III changing his mind on allowing the bones of the princes in the tower to be examined. So we'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um yeah, Maria. Basically, the Vatican is displaying Tudor era royal erotica. <laughs> yeah, I think they've been they've been as as with so much stuff, it's framed to suit the teller at the time. You know, are they love letters? Are they are they scandalous erotica? Are they I don't know, whatever else? You know, it, it, it all just. Um, are there signs of corruption? It, it, it's a it's it, it suits the agenda of whoever's telling the story at the time, which is something that has done is been done over and over again, and will I presume continue to be done because human beings are human beings. Right, before we get on to so it's Charles the Third story, we're going to talk about Princess Charlotte. Princess Charlotte, obviously, we have a Princess Charlotte now, so not to be confused with the cute daughter of William and Kate, Princess Charlotte was the um, granddaughter of George III. And we have a, um, oh, history has it has its eye on you, says the letters have been put in a published collection, um, some with the originals. So the originals were in um, English and French, um, some with translations, and it's available on Amazon. So there you go, people. Sorry, another book you want to read, or another thing you want to read. Um, yeah, so Princess Charlotte. Princess Charlotte is going to be a... Um, uh, a topic of one of the talks at the Georgian Online History Festival, which is taking place in March. Um, again, if you're on YouTube, the link to the festival is below in the comments. Um, and if you're on Instagram, you'll find the link in my bio to the festival. But Anne Stott is going to be giving us a talk about Princess Charlotte. She is, um, I don't know, if you want to put a thumbs up in the in the comments if you have heard of Princess Charlotte. I think her... Um, profile is um uh you know rising i think she is becoming better well known um but she is i mean her um existence and death are hugely pivotal in uh, in english and british history and her death was was tragic i actually spoke um with dr susie edge about 
um, Princess Charlotte's death. Um, I interviewed um, Susie last week and that will be available in February for any of you who haven't heard. Oh, thank you for the badge, Crystal. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Appreciated. Um, Susie Edge has written a book called Mortal Monarchs um, and it, it, she's included Princess Charlotte in, in that book anyway. So she was one of the people I wanted to ask Susie about in that interview. So that interview will be available next month um, and a full talk about Princess Charlotte available at the Georgian Online History Festival. That is an addition. So we now have our six speakers in place because Anne has made up the lineup. Um, and if you want your ticket for that, um, please head over to Eventbrite and search for the Georgian Online History Festival and you will find it or you can, as, like I say, under YouTube, under the in the YouTube comments, I've got the link to it. And in my Instagram bio, I also have the link to it. All of these things as well, by the way, you'll find links from on my Substack, which is philippab.substack.com and my website, britishhistorytours.com. So you should be able to find it. Please let me know if anything's missing and I will, I will update it. Um, so Charlotte, Okay, I wrote six pages of notes on Charlotte this morning. I got <laughs> totally into a story. Um, actually, a lot of them were on Caroline. Would you like me to... Um, I might cover a bit on her mother, Caroline, as well. Caroline, obviously, the... So Charlotte was the daughter of um, the Prince Regent. Um, so he was George, Prince of Wales, became the Prince Regent when his father, George III, um, was ill and he became Prince Regent. And then he was... George the fourth of debauchery fame although they were all a bit but yeah he was he was he was pretty he was the worst mm. so Charlotte was his only legitimate daughter um with his um with his wife Caroline Caroline of Brunswick um and they were first cousins always <laughs> <laughs> always questionable um yeah so so princess charlotte she was uh, their only daughter and she died at 21 she was only 21 years old and at the time of her death she was the only legitimate grandchild of george the third so george the third was still alive and all of his children were grown up i think the youngest of george the third's children at the time of charlotte's death was in his was 40 i think um, and she was the only legitimate, some of them hadn't even got married, let alone not being able to father children. They, they'd got children, but they weren't, well, they, they weren't legitimate. So Charlotte's death caused a constitutional crisis as well as being in, incredibly um, emotional. And um, it, I mean, it, it just caused grief, uh, literal grief <laughs> throughout the country. Um, so she predeceased her father and her grandfather. So her father, the Prince Regent, and her grandfather, George III. Um, I'll go into... I, I want to, oh, Maybe I'll talk to you about Caroline next week. Because Caroline, um, Caroline of Brunswick, the reason I started looking into her when I was looking into Charlotte's story was I was wondering, well, where was, where was she? How does she cope with the death of her only daughter? And... Oh, well, there's quite a lot of story there. She was actually in Italy. She'd been banished. George, George, um, uh, so the Prince Regent, married his, married his first uh, uh, cousin, Caroline of Brunswick, after already being um, married, apparently illegally. I'm not sure what the basis of it being illegal was to, some, to somebody else. And he's made to marry his first co co uh, cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. They split pretty much straight after um Charlotte's birth and George is forever then trying to divorce Caroline of Brunswick Charlotte's mother Char he, Charlotte is kept away from her mother or the, the access is, is severely restricted um and um not because George wanted to take over himself he didn't see Charlotte very much as well she's pretty much brought up by governesses and servants um but he's he yeah George was always looking for reasons to divorce Caroline and the 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 legal reason for divorce at the time would have been adultery neither of which neither of whom you know they were neither of them were going to admit to adultery and 
actually George in um, in 1820 tried to pass through an act of parliament um, and it was called pains and pen the pains and penalties bill and it was effectively a trial of Caroline um, an adultery trial for Carol of Caroline his wife whether had she or had she not um, committed adultery it was debated in the lords it passed on a very small margin but it was reported um, freely in the press about the debates and so public opinion was coming down very hard on Caroline's uh, side and it was decided that it needs to be dropped because it would have had to then pass, so it'd been through the House of Lords, it would then have had to pass through the House of Commons. And it was not going to get through the House of Commons because the public opinion um, was completely on Caroline's side, um, not, 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 the, um, not the Prince Rear, well, not the King's side. Because um, he passed through that bill because in, so that was in, well, later in 1820, in June 1820, he'd become King, you see. So he didn't want Caroline to be his queen. He'd, um, effectively banished her. She'd been in Italy, um, and um, she'd, she'd she'd got a servant that she'd supposedly had or got close to. So there was there was um, rumours that they had um, had an affair. But anyway, she she he didn't manage to get the bill passed. And what he did try and do though was bar Caroline from the from coronation. See, I said I might talk about Caroline next week, but I've got into it now. So let's just keep on with Caroline for a bit. Um, so you might have heard this because this is this is incredibly mm, it's cringy, actually. It, it sounds so humiliating. So George, George IV bars his wife, Caroline of Brunswick, who's come back to England um, despite Parliament trying to pay her off to stay away. She's come back to England or Britain, sorry, um, to assert her right to be queen consort. So this is why George comes up with this act of, um, what did I say it was called? The Act of Pains and Penalties Bill to take away all her titles and privileges. Um, it doesn't work. So then he just decides to, um, to be a child about it and bar Caroline from the coronation, which takes place on the 19th of July, 1821. She turns up to it. She still comes to the coronation, um, dressed up as far as I could tell. Um, and I think she tries four different entrances, all of her, all of wh 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 which all of them she is barred from going in and the doors shut in her face. Um, the crowds, of course, are out to watch the coronation and... Um, she loses a bit of her support here because it's seen as um, undignified and humiliating for her to, to have done this. Um, um, yeah. So, so she, yeah, so she, so George has his coronation bars, his wife, Caroline of Brunswick. He's already, he's, he's clearly trying to, he's, I mean, he's just dragged her name through the mud for, for years and years and years trying to, uh, accuse her of adultery but I mean there was commissions there was there was actual investigations into into possible adultery so you know he he was he, in fact there's a story that in uh so in May 1821 one of his ministers comes to him um oh Marie did I I did I freeze okay I don't know where I got to where did I get to let me tell you this little quip then about um uh, this little story about George um, before um, before I do a recap. So in, in May 1821, one of his ministers comes to him and says, um, sir, your worst enemy is dead. And he just he assumed it was Caroline, his wife. Uh, it was Napoleon. <laughs> so so he's, this his first thought of who his greatest enemy was when he's got Napoleon uh, was um, his wife, Caroline. So... Yeah. Um, so, right. Yes. History has it. It's I on you. I will get onto her, her, her funeral as well in a minute because Caroline actually didn't survive very much longer after the coronation. So she, she falls ill um, the day after, I think, or maybe the evening of the coronation. And um, 
she dies three weeks later on the 7th of August. She was only 53. And um, she, there's it, this is interesting because on her actual um, tombstone, let me see if I can find the, um, on the, da, 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 where did I write it down? So basically um, it states three, I can't find where I've written it, but it states three different possible causes of death. Cancer, an obstruction of the bowel, or poison it actually has that on her on her tomb now with her so her funeral um so george doesn't want um there to be much fuss um yeah doug says that's very suspicious that very evening well yeah clearly somebody thought it was a that poison was a possibility enough to put it on her on her tomb um which is in um brunswick she's in the the cathedral there um her funeral procession was not to go through any of the sort of central parts of london so not into the city of london and not westminster um however um caroline was popular she might have lost a little bit of support from some people who wanted to be snotty about her behaviour at the coronation, but um, she was generally popular. And of course, dying only three weeks la later, I imagine a lot of people forgot about that. Um, but the the crowds and there was there was violence um, that that ensued on both sides. Soldiers, um, two people got killed in the crowd. The the crowd were insisting on the funeral procession going through Westminster and the city of london they forced it to to go through um and then she and then her body goes abroad and and she's um she's buried in brunswick like i say but be, because she 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 realized that she was was dying and she got her affairs in air quotes in order burning all her papers burning her notebooks burning her diaries burning her letters um, and so there's a there's a lot I imagine that we don't know about Caroline. We don't know about her feelings and and what was going on. So so that's Charlotte's mother. Now so back to Charlotte. So um, like I said, despite being kept away from her mother Caroline, um, she didn't see much of her father either. <laughs> and um, she, so she she was she was she was apparently a little bit difficult I don't know as a child I, she sounds fun to me I don't know she <laughs> sounds like she was a bit of a um she's an only child she's an only child being brought up by a army of adults um I imagine the behavior is just as we would expect it to be honest now she um rejected her father's first um wish uh, as a, a, a suitor for her to marry which was a William Prince of Orange now I I, I tried to um, look into this so that I could explain to you which William of Orange this is let's just call him William of Orange because he, she rejects him she doesn't want to marry him she does agree to marry him to begin with but um, the, the engagement is broken off uh, later on now she fixates on Leopold um, Leopold of Saxe Coburg Salfield, and um, he's her choice. He's her choice, and she persuades her father um, George the Fourth to meet Leopold. He he invites him to Brighton um, in uh, in February eighteen sixteen, and actually he charms George. He decide George decides he he yeah he quite likes him, and the couple uh, were engaged in March eighteen sixteen. At which point, um, Leopold was voted by Parliament to, um, I don't quite sure of the exact uh, mechanism for this, but to become a British citizen and awarded £500,000 a year. Oh, I'm pausing on Instagram again. Let me just take a sip of my tea then. <laughs> mm. Right, I think I'm back on Instagram. So Leopold was given five hundred. pounds a thousand pounds a year now i don't know if any of you watched um is it just called victoria that was on a few years ago but i'm pretty sure that keeps coming up um in victoria because leopold um is the uncle of albert who marries victoria so anyway if any of you have watched that that would make sense um 
the couple got married um, in May 1816 at Carlton House. Now, actually, she'd had another fixation. There's somebody that she referred to as her Prussian, who she would have liked to marry. Um, and apparently it's not sure who who that was. Maybe Anne will be able to tell us more in her in her talk at the Georgian Festival. Um, but he he she gets news that he's he's married someone else anyway. Anyway, but despite that, her and Leopold, so Charlotte and Leopold are very happy together. They spend all of their time together. Um and apparently never tire of it. So they never get bored. And the couple choose, despite there being a massive party put on by um, by the king for Charlotte's 21st birthday, or I think it was Prince Regent's apology, sorry, at the time. Anyway, yes, he would have been, sorry. Of course, she dies before um, George III. Um, uh, despite the Prince Regent, her father putting on a massive 21st birthday party for her, her and Leopold decide to have a quiet night even in at home. <laughs> So, you know, they never, they really did like being each other's company. She suffers um, a miscarriage not long into the marriage, but gets pregnant again um, fairly quickly. Um, and so in April 1817, the Prince Regent is informed that Charlotte is uh, is yet again pregnant and everything seems to be going well. And th there's there's confidence that she will take this baby to term. Now, her physicians um, become concerned about her. She is eating a lot, not exercising at all, and they're concerned about the size of the baby. So they start to put her on a diet. They put her on a diet and that favourite um, weird <laughs> antiquated treatment of bleeding is also administered to her. And um, Leopold had brought his own physician over um, from home, uh, um, a man called Stock Store. What was his name? Can't remember. I'll find it. Um, now, Stockmar. His name Stockmar. Now he refuses to be part of Charlotte's medical team for her pregnancy and birth because of these, um, because of the, the 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 treatments they're they're handing out to Charlotte. He's not happy with these. So he doesn't he doesn't become part of her team. A um uh they call him an Akusha, sounds like a male midwife sort of role, is brought in called Sir Richard Croft. Now her due date of the 19th of October comes and goes. She finally goes into labour on the 3rd of November. Um so Croft, her, her male midwife, stroke doctor, don't quite know what 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 he's considered actually. It encourages her to exercise he bans her from eating she's not allowed to eat at this point um and he sends for the officials who will um who will witness the birth but her labor so her labor starts on third it continues through the fourth it continues through the fifth at which point um, an obstetrician called john sims is sent for but he's not allowed by croft to actually examine charlotte not clear why um, at nine o'clock on the 5th of November, Charlotte gives birth to a large, apparently, but, but, but important, a large baby boy, but he's unfortunately born, uh, born dead. He's still born, um, which she seems to take quite stoically. It's God's will. She's young. She's only 21. You know, that, that she's carried a baby to term. There'll be, there'll be more babies. Um, she had a meal. She seemed to be recovering. Leopold had stayed with her the entire time. So these this days and days long of labor, he stayed with her. So he has um he basically takes some opiates and goes to sleep. Now, unfortunately, not long after, so just soon after midnight onto the um onto the 6th of November, Charlotte begins vomiting. She is um complaining of abdominal pain she's when when sir richard um is, is brought back into the room he finds her cold struggling to breathe um, and she's and she's bleeding so um uh, uh stockmar um leopold's physician who had actually, actually been charlotte's physician as well before um just he didn't want to be part of the pregnancy team um he tries to raise Leopold he tries to wake him up and he take and he goes back into into the but he can't he can't wake Leopold and he goes back into the room and he finds um he finds Charlotte um 
in distress but saying they've made me they've made me tipsy they've, they've made me she's clearly feeling like she's lightheaded drunk so I don't know but she's she's feeling like she's she says like she's tipsy Stockmar leaves again to try and get to Leopold as he leaves the room she shouts him um this shows how familiar they are she shouts stocky stocky um by the time he's back in the room um, she she's passed away so Leopold doesn't get to um to to be with with Charlotte when she dies which is incredibly um incredibly sad now the reaction the public reaction is um is 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 huge um what would be a better word but it, it it's it, it it was described by an MP Henry um Brougham as it, it, well, he wrote, it really was as though every household throughout Great Britain had lost a favourite child. And every, people who could afford black wore black, people who couldn't afford to, to dress all in black wore black um, ribbons or armbands or over their clothes. The, um, the Royal Exchange, the law courts, the docks closed for two weeks, which is, I mean, that, that two weeks just shut down. That's incredible. Um, shops were closed for two weeks. Um George apparently was just prostate with grief. Now, Caroline, who we were talking about before, uh, Charlotte's mother, George refused to write to Caroline, Charlotte's mother. Caroline finds out via a courier who's sending a different message, presumably. He wasn't sent to her. So she finds out almost by accident that, um, that Charlotte's died. Um, Leopold is described by his physician Stockmar as never recovering happiness um, and much much later in 1832 Leopold marries again when he's, he's become king of the Belgians at that point and his youngest daughter um, named, was named Carlotta so after Charlotte um, so clearly he, he, he kept his memories of Charlotte all his life well, of course he would um now she's buried in st george's chapel windsor um well her and her baby and her, her baby son he's he's buried at her feet um and if you've ever been to st george's chapel in windsor um if you haven't pop it on your list then her monument is incredible and it was paid for by public subscription just shows um kind of the level of of mourning for for this princess um and it was uh sculpted by matthew coates wyatt i wrote that down for you if you want to have a look um maybe give it a google because in st george's i don't have any photographs i can share of the monument with you because you can't take photographs inside st george's chapel much to my chagrin um but the monument it's 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 massive it's huge and it it's incredibly moving to to look at because it's a shrouded um, you can see a, a figure um, of a woman on on a bed, shrouded um, in cloth, and then there's there's angels taking um, taking the baby up to heaven, and um, and another depiction of her going up to heaven as well. Thank you, Angie, for the badge. That's very very kind. Angie supporting me with the badge on Instagram. Thank you. Mm. Um, ah, chewing gums. Tell me your name again, sorry, because I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm miss, it's escaping me at the moment. You're going to St George's this year. Of course, St George's Chapel is now where um, Queen Elizabeth II is laid to rest as well. So, and Henry VIII is in there. Charles I is in there. Um, loads of people are in there. Ed Fourth is in there. Yeah, yeah. So, St George's Chapel. But yeah, it's um, so when you're in St George's Chapel. If you're right at the back of St George's Chapel, on your left, you will um, there's there's a, a chantry and you'll see um, Charlotte's tomb in there, her monument in there. Such was the grief, though the grief turned to anger. Some they were looking for people to blame. Who was to blame? Was it the Prince Regent for not going to the birth? Um, who else should have been at the birth? Who wasn't at the birth? Was it was it Sir Richard Croft the um, I'm going to call him male midwife because that makes more sense to us. Um, now, the post there was a post mortem. I don't know what a post mortem would have um, involved at this time, but because um, we're talking 1817, she dies November 1817. Um, so, there is a post mortem. It's inconclusive, but only three months after her uh, Charlotte's death, 
the the male murderer, wife, Sir Richard Croft, he's tending on another woman, and um, he just pick, he t- takes up a gun and shoots himself. So he actually does he commits suicide within three months of Charlotte's death, um, which is so the, there's a the tragedy continued. Um, now, not only was it a personal tragedy it was a constitutional crisis she was the only legitimate grand um child of george the third and with her death obviously the baby had also died um so the legitimate line had gone and like i said earlier if you were, if you were with me um at the beginning of this george the third's children were all grown up the youngest one i think was about 40 at the time of charlotte's death and none of them between them had had other than sorry obviously Charlotte none of that none of the others had had any legitimate children so there was this bizarre um race to get a legitimate child um it was you know this is a time of papers newspapers really really you know people went to the went to their newspapers for um for their only source of news really and the papers were having influence on um, the direction of politics and the royal family and the papers were calling for you know ditch your mistresses and get married you've got you've got you've got literally you've got some work to do um now edward duke of kent was one of um george the third's uh sons who was living with his mistress um over in brussels he gets rid of his mistress who has a wonderful name julie de saint laurent might have made that even more anyway there you go um he 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 dismissed her straight away and proposed to leopold to charlotte's widow widower he uh he um, proposes to leopold's sister victoria they they come back in fact they come back in time for the birth of victoria alexandrina victoria who would become our queen victoria so actually without the death of charlotte we wouldn't have had Victoria. Barbie, it is a lot of information. I hope, I hope this is not overload today. We'll get on to a little bit of an opinion piece now, okay? We can have a little bit of a discussion now. I did, though, have a little go at... Um, I might write this up for you later. This is, this is, the, this is the, the, the family tree. I was like, so how many first cousins are involved here? So, yeah, George IV and his wife, Carolina Brunswick, were first cousins. And, of course, we know Victoria and Albert were first cousins. But that's, that's a story for another day. Um, now, just as a reminder, so Anne Stott will be doing a talk on Princess Charlotte in the Georgian Online History Festival. So if you want tickets for that, um, we had a really good time at the Stuart Online History Festival in the autumn. And I think lots of people who came to that have already got their tickets for the Georgian one. Um so you can follow the link in the show notes or in the bio for um, for that. Um, and don't worry if you can't make the actual dates because all of the talks will be available for a couple of months um, following. Uh, Marion says it's so moving, talking about the monument of Char- for Charlotte. Um, you can't help but feel sad at seeing it. Yeah, even if you don't know the story behind it, it's clear when you look at Charlotte's monument just how... Mm, how emotion, you know, the, the, you're looking at the the monument of somebody who was well loved, important in people's hearts. You, you, I mean, if any of you were around um, for, you know, when when Princess Diana um, died in in ninety seven, um, that outpouring of grief, well, and the Queen, but the, I think the, I think the likeness to the death of Diana comes from the shock value. You know, Princess Charlotte was was about to give birth to the heir to the throne. There were, the bookies were taking um, loads of bets on would it be a boy or a girl? You know, when would it be born? Or well, I don't know, what would the name be? I'm sure there was all sorts of bets going on. Um, so to hear that she'd, she'd died so suddenly at the age of 21, just, um, you know, must have just, well, it did. It floored people. It floored people. Yeah. So let's get on to um, something else. Hmm. Um, before I do, just a reminder, if you want to be part of the Historic Book Club, we're doing that over in my Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash British History. It's just one of the benefits of being being in it. But if you go over 
Obviously, whenever you join, you're perfectly welcome to join into book club. But if you get in before Sunday, you get to vote on which books we're looking at this year. Um, Mer yeah, Jenna says on the PBS show, Victoria. Yeah, so yours is P so it's PBS in the US. I can't remember who put it on over here. Um, might have been BBC. I don't know. Portrayed Leopold as a very nice man. Yes, I always liked him in the show. He did, but I'm sure in that show they keep referring back to this £50,000 allowance that Leopold had. I think he might have kept on drawing it after Charlotte's death. Well, that was the insinuation in that programme anyway. So shall we get on to Charles III and the Bones? Oh, actually, first, we will. Oh, Doug says it was ITV. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, well done, well done you. Sorry. Right. Now, this perfect trip out, perfect day out, should I say, for a Tudor history fan. Okay, it's a bit of a plug because it's part of the Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots tour, but check this out. Check this out anyway. Um, and I might look to put this on as a short tour at some point. But anyway, it's part of this September's tour. We're going to go to Kenilworth Castle, um, which is in Kenilworth. And this is Kenilworth Castle for anyone who who doesn't know or thinks oh, that rings a bell. This is it was the seat of um, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. Um, he added it. Um, sorry, he added to it um, for Elizabeth's visits. And she spent a long time there, 19 days, possibly should have been 21. But 19 days in 1575, it was effectively a protracted um <laughs> it's effectively a protracted, uh, I've just seen Phil's comment, um, uh, marriage proposal. Um, so anyway, we're going to Kenilworth Castle first. Kenilworth Castle is awesome, Lauren, you are correct. Now, Phil has just said <laughs> Harvington Hall. Uh, yeah, but before we go to Harvington Hall, we will be going into the Lord Leicester Hospital. Now, anyone, if, anyone who's been with me a few weeks will know that I am... Um, just, I was beside myself excited um, getting into the Lord Leicester Hospital. It's currently closed for renovations, and um, it's like a, a, every hundred years it needs a it needs a big sort of um, look at everything and make sure that everything's good. Now, one of the things they're doing though is making it fully accessible, which is fantastic. Really clever ways of doing it, I have to say, like raising the floor and putting the original floorboards back and so that you don't get lips that people can trip over and uh, make it difficult for wheelchairs. They're doing all of this wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, and it reopens in the summer. Now, the day we're going, it's not open to the public. So we're getting exclusive access into the Lord Lester Hospital. We're getting a tour, guided tour by Heidi Mayer herself. She's the current master of Lord Lester Hospital. Honestly, I can't be. I couldn't be more excited that we've got this into into this day. Um, the Lord Leicester Hospital is just so it was. Its name is because it was set up by Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, as almshouses, utilizing buildings that were already on the site. The actual site goes back to I think is it twelfth century, twelfth or thirteenth century, and he utilizes those buildings. So it's called the Lord Leicester Hospital, and it's hospital. I always think more in the um, at the root of the word in like the hospitality root of the word as opposed to hospital like it didn't give medical care but it gave um uh homes and food to uh you know for fallen sorry soldiers i'm gonna say fallen soldiers for the fallen they're not there are they um but you know retired soldiers injured soldiers um and um i've did I write the article? Did I write the article? It might have been in my last newsletter. I was talking about the Lord Leicester Hospital and why Robert um, uh, set it up. And there was there was basically in Elizabethan England, Elizabeth inherits an incredibly huge homeless problem because of her father's decision to close the monasteries. And there's different incentives or different, no, actually I wouldn't call them incentives, kind of um, uh, edicts given, Acts of Parliament that, provide arms but expect you know people with means to do things like set up these institutions so robert's probably um trying to impress elizabeth but also his brother ambrose was an injured soldier i mean ambrose was a man of means um but 
if you weren't, what was going to happen? So I think that might have been playing on Robert's mind as well. And if you want to listen to more information about the Lord Lester Hospital, um, my interview with with Heidi Mayer is on YouTube. Um, it's um, it's a behind the scenes look at the Lord Lester Hospital. So you can see that. But we get to go when the public aren't there. We get to get so exclusive access and Heidi herself will be showing us around. So that's part of the uh, this day on the Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots tour. So we'll have gone to Kenilworth. Then we get exclusive access to the Lord Lester Hospital. And then we go to the incredible, delightful, you won't forget it, Harvington Hall which I don't know if Phil's still watching, but Phil's the house manager there. Um, it's an Elizabethan manor house. Again, the whole site has a lot um, of history going back further. Um, but it's a recusance house in the time of Elizabeth, so a Catholic family. Um, and again, it's closed to the public. So when we when we go, so Phil um, <laughs> uh, will be showing us around and... Um, <laughs> Phil certainly say that because I'm watching. Yeah, but I was going to mention it anyway, Phil, I promise. And um, yeah, so Phil's going to be showing us around along with James, the assistant house manager. And um, and then we, we get an audience with Elizabeth I in this recusant house. What is she going to say? That's the incredible Leslie Smith, who's just, if any of you have watched her, if you haven't seen her, look her up. Um, there's an interview with her as well on my YouTube, but you'll, you'll probably find other, other things um, uh, uh, on there. Um, oh, Marie says, uh, so it's not Phil, it's the pretty redhead when he's in his Tudor garb. Phil basically is a Tudor, isn't it? He, you are, you are completely a Tudor. You, you're born in the wrong time, <laughs> but we're grateful for it. So yeah, so we, so, so our day is topped off by then, as if that's not enough, we have a meal in the Great Hall of Harvington Hall. So it's going to be an absolute fabulous day. Now, what does that sound like for a Tudor fan? So if you, honestly, if you're looking for a Tudor history tour, the Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots tour that we've got in September, we've still got a few spaces left. If you're interested in coming, but you need to come on your own and you're looking to share a room, let me know because I may be able to pair you up with somebody. We, we do that quite regularly on tours. Um, and what's fabulous is people make friends that they then, We've, I've got people coming in July who are coming for the third time in their pairing that was a they didn't know each other before they came on the first tour they were paired together and they've since come back once last year they're coming back this year so the friendships that are made are just absolutely fabulous on these tours so but yeah so what a day that's just one day out of the tour if you want more information about any of the tours look on britishhistorytours.com now just um, someone asked a little bit earlier sorry I was I was um, knowing I'd come back to it about book club so again if you want to um, join book club that's on my patreon so you go to patreon.com forward slash british history or one word you can find a link in the bio on instagram and in the show notes on youtube and I'm not completely sure where on facebook <laughs> but but if you go to my website you find links to all of these things as, as well now to finish off Let's talk about, I'm going to have to switch screens on my laptop, Charles III and the bones of the princess in the tower. Now, I don't know if you remember, but in the autumn, um, obviously when the, the queen had died and, and so Charles, of course, becomes king. And one of the stories that was circulating um, was quite a bit of excitement around the fact, well, the queen had always said that she would prefer she was saying the print the princes those bones that are in, uh, in Westminster Abbey they were discovered in the Tower of London they were um, interred in Westminster Abbey uh, actually in the same side chapel that Elizabeth I is in but anyway um, they would remain there to so Christian burial you know that they, 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 they'd need to be left undisturbed Charles when he was Prince of Wales had talked about maybe when he became king allowing the bones to be um to be examined and to see what happened there people got very excited about this um thinking that this is gonna this is going to solve the mystery of the princes in the tower um now i wasn't convinced but anyway because <laughs> i can't really see how it does but let me um thank you to martha martha zoller for sending me this article 
Um, it was in the Daily Mail on the 18th of January, 2023. Again, if you're on YouTube, the link to it is in the um, show notes. And it's actually hidden in an article about, I think ostensibly about Harry and Meghan. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the princes in the tower bones. So I'm going to read you a bit of it so you know what I'm going on about. Um, there were hopes. Uh, this is from the article by is it John McKenty, I think. It's not very clear on here. So there were hopes that the new king would overrule the late his late mother and allow DNA tests on the alleged alleged bones of the princes in the tower. So these are the ones that are in Westminster Abbey. The Queen refused permission for work on the bones interred in Westminster Abbey. Excuse me, I've already said that. After the princes were supposedly murdered in the Tower of London by Richard III in his bid for succession. A source says unidentified, so we can't verify this. A source says King Charles, who was Prince of Wales, was keen to identify Edward IV's heirs, they were his sons, now wants the bones to rest in peace. He has been advised that there could be no way of confirming that the remains, even if of the right age, are those of the princes Edward XII and Richard IX, the source says. And identifying the killer would be impossible. And then it goes on to something else. So this is the only place I have seen it. And despite a uh, yeah, the extensive Google search <laughs> that, everyone, that I did, um, but I have tried various different ways of trying to to find this um, this story somewhere else. So I I haven't seen it anywhere else. Um, maybe it's just going to go quiet. But it, if this if this article in the Daily Mail is correct, then Charles has been dissuaded um, from allowing the princes in the tower, the, the bones that are supposed to be the princes in the tower, to be um, to be examined. Um, which, I mean, you can pop in the comments what you think about that. Do you think they should be examined? Um, I asked Susie Edge this. So this this actual question about the bones. Um, uh, I I put to Su Dr. Susie Edge, what does what does she think? Because she does talk about it in her in her book, um, and it's sort of one of those things that for somebody um, in the medical profession, you, you sort of if it came if the opportunity came along, could you actually say no? Um, Lottie says, I personally think the bones should be examined. Obviously, it would be conducted respectfully, and there's a, if there's a chance, it would expand. If it was a chance to expand knowledge, that's my um, concern with it. Actually, I don't think it would expand the knowledge. I don't really see how it would, um, because what people really want to know is how did they die and who killed them. And those bones are not going to tell us that. Um, so yeah, so Tash says um, I'd love to see the bones examined to solve the mystery. That's the problem. I don't think it would solve the mystery. Um, also, I'm not sure how long the bone like. I think there's a, a bit of a, um, a, not a deadline, but I don't know how much DNA they would contain to be able to actually ident even identify them. Um, Doug says, sounds like they have no control DNA. They'd probably have to dig that up too, and it would never end. Yeah, who else would they have to dig up to be able to identify, uh, to make an, a pos positive identification? That is a good is a good point. But uh, yeah, so I, cause I haven't seen that story anywhere else and I'm thankful to Martha to, for sending that on to me. Um, I'm wondering whether it will now just go a bit quiet. Um, Captain Asa, Asa thinks the bones should be left alone. Um, that, that's the side I, that's the side I'm, I think I'm erring on, but I do understand, um, absolutely, um, people who would like to, you know, like to have a look at the bones and see if it was, if it was the boys. Um, uh, yeah, so, but yeah, like, so Sam said, examination of the bones. Oh, Sam, I'm going to mention your competition in a minute. I, I, I will mention that while I'm on. Um, people, if you want a chewed address, stay, stay tuned for a second more. Um, examination of the bones, if they were the boys would only, would prove the pretenders were just that. Yeah. Um, Mint Pixie says, no, leave them alone. There's no point. So it's, it's. Yeah, I would have to, um, you know, I would really want to sit down and speak to someone who knows about what information could be grabbed from these bones. How conclusive would it be? 
Um, but then also, you know, we, you, we're not going to find out how they died. We're not going to find out when probably or who um, and you can only date the bones I think within a few years anyway so it's not going to give you an exact age of the of the children um Lottie Rose says what I'm uh, also curious about is if it's even them yeah exactly we don't even know if it is them since the bones were found during the reign of Charles II indeed they weren't found till a lot lot later um Maria says I'd love to see people just leave oh sorry it keeps popping uh, remains of dead people in rest um this i feel is reason number one why a lot of people opt for cremation upon their death because of biddy bodies digging around in graves it's isn't it one i think it's so interesting how um let's think about this it's a, it's a little bit of a bring you down to um to earth moment henry VIII doesn't have a tomb uh let's think of loads of others king harold's uh any, well anyone anyone buried in a abbey before the dissolution of the abbeys, whatever ranking they ever had, <laughs> probably got their tomb decimated. Um, you then had the English Civil Wars that took a load more. Um, you know, you've got people like Catherine Parr, who uh, she her body managed to survive the um, the the, the um, uh, civil war, even though it was a, a church um, that was overtaken by the parliamentarians. But then only to be uh, to, to be discovered and, and wrenched open by a farmer on the bequest of some women picnickers. <laughs> like I can see why people opt for cremation. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah. Um, now, so before I go, let me just mention because on the sixteenth of April I will be going live with Sam, the Tudor royalty experience, me and the History After Dark girls. Oh, I must mention that we're on live tonight as well, actually. But anyway, um, the, with the History After Dark girls, so we'll be um, on the sixteenth of April with Sam, the Tudor royalty experience, and we will be picking the winners of Sam's current competition. The first prize of which is a bespoke Tudor gown. So I'm I'm like I'm mortified. I can't I can't take part because I'm choosing the winner. Oh, the winner's me. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, anyone who wants more information, have a look at Sam's um, profile on Tudor Royalty Experience on Instagram. Um, and you can buy a ticket and you're entered into into the draw. Ooh, history has has its eye on you it's her birthday on the 16th i think it's also sam's birthday so yeah um so yeah so do that if you're around tonight quarter past eight uh my time so whatever time it is where you are the history after dark girls are together for discussing our next in the series of deceased gits it is charles dickens tonight so if you can join us, we'll be streaming live on YouTube and Instagram. It's history.after.dark on Instagram and just history after dark on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, so we'll be we'll be discussing Charles Dickens tonight on History After Dark. I hope I see you then. Everyone, thank you so much. We've run over today, but thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for sticking with me. And I hope you enjoyed that. I will see you either tonight if you're around or next week. All right, same time next week if uh, if this suits. All right, see you soon.